And welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 6 9 21. Well, now that the now that the pandemic appears to have uh, gone out with a whimper, certainly in many parts of these here United States, although there are countries that have uh, probably countries like Canada, maybe they'll make a mask mandate permanent. Maybe the restrictions will become permanent. You have to wonder. The rates are falling like a stone. You may like or not like the vaccines, but certainly they appear to have brought down the incidence, the rate of COVID down. Can we please get back to normal? That's the question. Well, conferences are taking place in Florida and around the country. So in that regard, maybe we're getting back to normal. Our good friend, George Gammon is with us now. George, great to have you back on. And you've got a, a conference going on very shortly in Miami. Tell us about I it. I do. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Kerry. It's always great to talk to you. But uh, yeah, we've got Rebel Capitalist Live going on. And we set this up about maybe four months ago, something like that. And uh, I thought, and back then, Florida wasn't as open as it is today. You know, the country wasn't as open. And uh, I thought, we, we have to get back to normalcy. Human beings are not meant to be locked up in a cage. And they're not meant to just communicate with people over Zoom or Skype. They're actually meant to communicate with people face-to-face and so I set this conference up. It was back then is quite a bit of a risk because you didn't know if we were going to have this second wave where the states would shut back down. I assumed that Florida wouldn't. And that's why I did the event here in the first place. And uh, pretty much every speaker I, uh, I got in touch with was not only said yes, but was super, super excited because they're in the same boat. They're like, thank you so much, George, for doing this. It's, uh, you know, I haven't been out of my house or I haven't had a, I haven't been to any conferences in the last year and a half, and I'm so anxious to get back to it. And we had a huge response from the people buying tickets. So I think um, pretty much everyone out there, at least the people that are coming to my conference, are ready to get back to normal and, uh, you know, take advantage of hearing speakers face to face interacting with like minded individuals to help them make better decisions in the future, financial decisions. I, and uh, and really, maybe that is your biggest contribution uh, to date, George, is like, hey, we can actually have a conference where real live people can show up. Look, I've been uh, dealing in Zoom and Skype and every other messaging uh, digital communications platform for years now and working from my home so for me honestly uh, covid the whole pandemic not a big deal from that standpoint but in terms of the rest of your life of uh, actually meeting with people and going to conferences traveling all those mm -hmm. little things really we've uh, we've gone the past year the last airplane flight i took was in March of uh, 2020. Now I'm about to go going to New York, Las Vegas, Wyoming uh, for a mine tour, finally getting back to normal. So it's got to feel really good for you as well, as well as uh, the group that's going to be there, all 700 of them. It does. And what really drove this home for me is, in fact, I was right in your neck of the woods there. I was in West Palm, and I had lunch with Jeff Snyder, who most people know from FinTwit and Real Vision and Macro Voices and his own podcast. And, you know, brilliant guy. But he's someone that I've interviewed for my channel at least four or five times. And I've heard him on Macro Voices just tons of times. I've heard him on Real Vision. And so it's not that I his ideas were, were new to me, you know, in the euro dollar and the monetary system and whatnot. But I was able to meet him for lunch and sit down and talk to him face to face for about an hour and a half. And I learned more in that hour and a half of talking with him face to face than I did by the four or five times I've actually interviewed him and the hundred podcast episodes 
or videos that I've seen him uh, featured on Real Vision or YouTube. It's something about talking to someone uh, and looking them in the eye and going back and forth with the dialogue that just um, you cannot replace. Yeah, well, it's so true. It's called human connection. And yeah. we're social creatures. So maybe that's been the worst damage from all of these insane COVID lockdown restrictions is restricting you from getting together with business associates, with friends. Because look, I mean, I will confess that the world's becoming more virtual. A lot of conferences that used to take place face to face no longer do. They're virtual conferences, largely a question of economics that people don't want to pay thousands of dollars to go to trivial conferences anymore. But there still are conferences in every industry that you have to go to, you got to be there, that you're really missing out on something if you don't. So everybody says that everything's changing, um, the new normal and all that, but uh, have people really changed through the pandemic? No. No, they haven't. <laughs> That's an easy question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so true. So as far as the global economy, though, that has changed. That's been oh, yeah. drastically affected. Uh, we see these supply chain disruptions all over the place, whether it's semiconductors, food, throw in a couple of acts of cyber terrorism and you got a dystopian uh, world that's shaping up before our very eyes. Yeah, and I think it goes back to understanding what wealth is. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of go off on a tangent here, but I'll, I'll pull it back around. If, if most people think of wealth as the amount of dollars or currency units that they have, you know, they think it's in their bank account, but they don't realize that their bank account is really just a, an electronic liability of the commercial banking system. There's there's nothing really tangible in there. You know, they can redeem those, that liability for cash, but um, it, it's just basically an IOU uh, saying IOU IOUs because the dollar in and of itself is an IOU. But th this is what people associate wealth with is the amount of currency units. And this is people have to get out of this mindset because if that were true, then Venezuela or Zimbabwe or Weimar Germany would have been the most uh, wealthy countries in human history. But we know they're not. So why is that? It's because wealth is measured by the amount of goods and services a society can create or produce efficiently. And it's just that example I always use, I got from Shift that, you know, if you're on a desert island and all you have is uh, a tr case full of a billion dollars, are you richer or are you poor? And the answer is obviously you're poor because you can't buy anything. There, there, there's no stuff there. And so once we realize that, then we, and once we see the world and economics and everything the government and the Fed is doing through that lens, we can start to see the damage that all these distortions are creating. So let's look at the stimulus checks as an example. So all these stimulus checks go out, the government $5 trillion in deficit spending. We're going to have stimulus package after stimulus package. What you have to ask yourself, just to get down to the nitty gritty, is, is this action the government is taking is this going to create an environment where we're producing more goods and services or fewer goods and services in the past? And I think especially when you look at these uh, additional unemployment benefits and stimulus checks, yes, they, they, I mean, I guess there's kind of an argument that they could have been needed there for a while, but now you've got the government competing with employers and most people are choosing, well, not most, but a lot of people are choosing to stay home. You can see it in all the statistics where every, and you can see it anecdotally in your own life too. I mean, I'm sitting here in a parking lot talking to you in front of a restaurant and the, the restaurant has signs up in every single window. And it's not about a daily special. Every sign says we're hiring. <laughs> We're hiring every single sign. And you, and I'm sure the people listening to this right now have experienced that in their own life. Every single business out there is short 
on employees. They just can't get people to work. And I think that's a direct result of these distortions of the stimulus checks and of the additional uh, unemployment benefits. And again, you have to ask yourself over the long run, does this create an economy that is producing more or producing less? And I think the obvious answer is that it, we're going to produce less. And therefore, regardless of how many currency units we have in our bank accounts, as an aggregate total, we're going to be poorer. And that means inflation, right? Or actually, we have to specify that because technically inflation is an increase in the money supply. What most yeah. people think of, most of you out there think of, when you think of inflation, is rising consumer prices. Paying more at the gas pump, paying more at the supermarket, all of those things. Now, that's really a byproduct of inflation, and that's why most of you out there don't really understand what inflation is. So money supply, excess money supply can be soaked up in a number of ways, higher asset prices, higher real estate, uh, et cetera, higher home prices. We've seen that happen. But now we're starting to see higher commodity prices and mm -hmm. higher consumer prices. And that makes a society poorer, doesn't it? Yeah, because usually incomes are going to lag the cost of goods and services. And, you know, it's interesting. I saw that Janet Yellen came out, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day prior or something like that, and started to acknowledge that we that this inflation we're seeing as far as consumer price inflation may not be transient. But her point was, even if it's not transient, it, it's not that bad. We, we should look at it as the economy is booming. And why is a booming economy uh, something that's, that should be frowned upon? And <laughs> you have to, uh, these, these Keynesians or the people like Janet Yellen or, or Powell, and, you know, it's laughable that they think that just price is going up somehow implies that uh, the economy or society, the standard of living is actually increasing for the average Joe and Jane. But I, I think in the back of her mind, if we assume she's, uh, you know, has a, a degree of integrity, which I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, well, we could I, debate I, that one, but let's yeah. just say <laughs> for the sake of our discussion here, George, yeah, she she's a, a person of the highest integrity. Yeah, I, I think how she can square that circle is if you see inflation, it, it, you realize that the banking system, and again, I want to preface by saying this is kind of how the way it was in the past, and I'll, I'll get back to this. But I think in her mind, she sees inflation as um, the lesser of two evils in the sense that it at least shows that the banking system is a little healthier in the sense that they're creating more loans. Because if they're creating more loans, then theoretically you're, you're increasing the money supply. Therefore, you're seeing inflation. Therefore, if you see inflation, that implies that there's a lot of lending going on, and that implies that the banking system is healthy. Now, uh, if anyone would say, well, that's kind of half true because then you've got the standard of living going down for the average Joe because their wages aren't going up at the same rate as the price they're paying at the grocery store. But I, get, I think that's why she thinks it may be the lesser of two evils. The, but the problem with that is that's looking at the system the way it has been for the last, I don't know, let's say um, since Bretton Woods where, <clears throat> excuse me, so that where the commercial banking system was actually responsible for creating the majority of the dollars that we had in the system, especially domestically. And then we got the euro dollar system where international banks started to create uh, dollar deposits, you know, dollar commercial bank liabilities. And uh, that grew exponentially. And uh, that's kind of how the system works. So it wasn't that the Fed was really in control of the dollar. Uh, really, it was the commercial banking system. I always say it wasn't necessarily Jerome Powell. It's more Jamie Dimon uh, that's in control of the dollar. But now what happened what, once we had COVID is we turned into this kind of hybrid system where the government, their, their uh, deficits are so large and they're being monetized by the Fed. 
And this is something where now the government is actually increasing the money supply, especially when you look at just straight M2. And that's why when you look at the M2 charts going back to 2020, you see that M2 broad money increased by like 25% in one year. Well, how does that happen? It's because the government is spending all this money and they're not sucking the money out of the system before they spend it. So normally they would suck the money out by the private sector buying bonds or paying right. taxes. Mm -hmm. But now what they're doing is they're just spending the money and the Fed's buying those uh, treasuries with bank reserves that they just right. create out of thin air, you know, funny money. And therefore you get on aggregate total on net balance, you get an increase in the money supply. So that's where I think Janet Yellen's thinking is rather flawed in the sense that um, she's looking at the past and kind of the rear view mirror, even, even if we're giving her the benefit of the doubt, where I think she needs to look at the way things are and where they're going. And if we're moving from this hybrid system where the government now is in control of uh, the amount of dollars and they're taking that away from the banking system, I think the Fed, if they're smart, is going to look at that and say, well, this is – you know, now we've got the politicians in charge of creating new dollars. This is worse than having Jamie Dimon in control. Yeah. So we need to take back control. We need to actually be a central bank and we need to be the center of the dollar monetary mm -hmm. system. And really the only way they can achieve that, in my opinion, is by setting up a central bank digital currency, by banning cash. So we all have accounts with the Fed and therefore they're in charge or they can issue loans directly into the real economy, which will increase the supply of dollars. And I'd like to remind everyone listening right now that the Fed is the third central bank we've had in the United States. The first one was set up by Alexander Hamilton. And if you read why he wanted a central bank, it wasn't just to fund the government, it was actually more so to fund the private sector and to, and to issue loans directly to businesses and individuals. That's what he wanted the central bank to do, the first one. And I think the Fed is going to go back to the central bank and what they used to do. And just to reiterate, that's where the Fed will be in control of not only consumer, but business lending as well. They'll circumnavigate the commercial bank and get around the politicians. All right, well, I like the idea of it for sure. And I hope, uh, I only hope that they see the wisdom of your ways, George. And, <laughs> you know, uh, hey, we just have to hope that, uh, that, that it happens, right? Well, it, you, you, there, there's a give and take there because now you're really centralizing the control of lending. And um, you know, I don't know that for my next mortgage, I want to have to ask Jerome Powell for it. Yeah. I, you know, so that's a little scary. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that's for sure. So it's like, who do you want to control this? The banksters or the central banksters? It's uh, it's really um, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Absolutely. Well, I could not agree with you more, George. Uh, <laughs> hey, conference sounds great. Sorry I won't be there, but maybe I'll catch the next one. If people want to connect with you on the web, watch your videos. Where do you go? Oh, you can just Google my name. It's first name George, typical spelling, last name Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N. That'll pull up all the YouTube, the Twitter, the Instagram, and my website. Excellent. Hey, and if you got a question for George, we will email it off to him. Just send it to me, kl at kerrylutz.com. Promise we'll get back to you on it. And don't forget, sign up for your free newsletter on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. George, good luck on the conference. Pleasure to talk to you again, and stay well and stay free. All right. Thanks, Carrie.